pleasure to uh, introduce Marco Riatti. Um, Marco has an equally interesting uh, background uh, to Manuela. Um, he got his uh, university degree, which is called the Laurea in Italy, in physics at the University of, uh, of Pisa. And then um, he went on to the uh, Gatsby Computational Neuroscience Unit at University of College London, where his supervisor was Jeff Hinton. That's the Jeff Hinton. Our <laughs> 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 <Yeah. laughs> his, pro <laughs> his project, if I, I'm going I'm to try to, 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 to state Please. this, uh. it, it's just his barest skeletal form. Um, uh, looked at the common, uh, a common property uh, of um, long-range correlation for uh, genetics, uh, ganglion cells in the cat retina, and EEG signal. And um, when I, I mentioned this to Ali Reza a few, a few uh, minutes ago. He said, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes. He's a physicist, too. <laughs> These are all time series analyses. Yes. <laughs> That's true. Um, so after uh, he got his uh, degree at, um, at the Gatsby, he went on to get a PhD at the University of Paris. Um, and that worked at the, uh, at the neurospin there, uh, where his uh, uh, supervisor was first Carl van Riesche. Van Zweig. Carl van Weisweig. Yes. And then uh, Gislaine de Hem uh, Lamberts. Yes. Uh, and he was the uh, director of their MEG and EEG laboratory for five years. Yes. There. And now he's at the uh, University of Trento in the uh, CHIMEC, that's the Center for Mind Brain Sciences, uh, where he is the director for the uh, Human Newborn EEG Lab. And he'll be talking about uh, that recent work now yes. with wonderful pictures in, on the slides. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, first of all, uh, thank you a lot, Jim, for uh, inviting me here today to present my work. I'm honored to present it here in this great lab. Um, so, as you see from the title, uh, so the main focus of this seminar will be on the work that uh, we did on face processing in newborns. But I will also uh, briefly mention at the end some very preliminary results on number processing in newborns by linking to the presentation of uh, Manuela yesterday. Uh, and of course, this is work in collaboration with her. And uh, throughout the uh, uh, presentation, I hope I will show you uh, a prosomizing uh, way of um, uh, investigating uh, the neural underpinnings of uh, perceptual and cognitive uh, functions in newborns. So first of all, face processing. Uh, if, I, if I think of an image representing the, the, the bulk of this work, is this kind of image. And this is linked, in fact, also to my personal experience as a father. Uh, so where my uh, first child was born, um, uh, even if despite his sort of uh, uh, apparent uh, clumsiness and uh, numbness of expression uh, at the beginning, uh, what struck me is that uh, after minutes, uh, that he, uh, after his birth, he was able to stare at uh, Manuela, at my wife, <laughs> uh, um, and uh, uh, really focus on the face of her. And uh, of also later on, two hours later, I, I was able to have him in my arms, and he was able to stare at me with a focus that really surprised me. Um, so this effect of uh, face preference in newborns is now very well known and very well uh, reproduced in many uh, experiments. And uh, um, in particular, um, it has been shown uh, uh, in more studies with this kind of uh, looking preferences. So uh, if you present a newborn with uh, two images like this, so these are schematic face-like images in which uh, it, it is like the simplest possible image representing a face. And it's really simple. It's just the contour of a face. And then you see on the left, uh, left image uh, two, two squares representing the eyes and one square representing the mouth. 
and the control image is just the same but uh, with the dots inverted so from the uh, uh, perceptual point of view it's really equivalent but it has only a difference in the configuration so if you present these images to a newborn uh, the newborn will look longer to the face-like image than to the inverted face image and this uh, even minutes after birth and uh, this effect has been reproduced also with real faces uh, for example so if you uh, compare a real face and an inverted real face, you have the same kind of preference. So the question here is, um, how is it possible that newborns with very extremely limited visual experience and a visual system that is still very immature are show this preference? And in order to formulate uh, better the hypothesis uh, behind our study, I will go into other domain where uh, we know uh, uh, and you know better than me uh, all the aspects of face processing in adults so we know very well that face perception in adults is very important because it's a key competence for social interaction and this is probably the main reason why adults are very uh, efficient uh, uh, in uh, many aspects of face processing uh, for example in face detection uh, in fact, faces are probably the visual object for which we are uh, most uh, rapid to detect and most efficient. For example, if I show you two images uh, like those and uh, I ask you to do a saccade as fast as possible to the image containing a face, uh, you are very fast. Uh, you do a saccade in, in 100 and something milliseconds and you are faster than uh, if you I present you with animals so if the target is an animal or a vehicle you are faster and you are more accurate than in the other uh, for the other visual objects so um, what is the uh, neural what how the, does the brain allow us to do such a very fast and efficient uh, uh, detection um, uh, we know uh, from from the similar work of Jim uh, among others that uh, we are endowed with a um, specialized distributed cortical network that allows us to process faces uh, differently from other uh, visual objects. And uh, uh, the, here I represent the uh, so-called core face network, the, the face network that allows us to detect faces and, uh, and the identity of faces and, uh, um, and is present, um, is very reproducible across uh, subjects. And uh, you know very well that the, the most three most important areas in this network are the inferior occipital gyrus, so the so-called occipital face area, the superior temporal sulcus, and the lateral fusiform gyrus. So now, in order to understand what happens in newborns, I, I do a sort of uh, digression in, in the time of development. Uh, and. Uh, uh, I go straight on to the, uh, exper the fMRI experiment that was done on investigating face processing with the uh, youngest possible subjects. This is a study from uh, 2017. Um, and these are really the, the, the youngest subject, four to months year, uh, months year old. And as you can see, the um, cortical circuits of face processing is uh, very similar to the one that we see in adults and in also in older children. The only uh, aspect that changes uh, um, is uh, uh, lower selectivity. So the same regions that are, uh, uh, that are selective, the preferred faces in, uh, um, in infants are also more active to um, the visual, uh, other visual objects with respect to adults. But apart from that, the regions are really, really uh, very similar to what we see in adults. Um, the problem is that we it's very difficult and practically difficult to do an FRI experiment on newborns. So it's difficult to, to dig into this question uh, for newborns. Um, and what about EEG, uh, electroencephalography, which is a technique that is uh, more easily uh, uh, applied to newborns? Um, in adults, we know that there is a very uh, reproducible correlate of uh, face perception 
which is an event-related potential wave at about 170 milliseconds, uh, which amplitude is uh, systematically higher for phases with respect to other visual objects. And uh, um, there are also many studies um, in, uh, in infants, down to two, three months old infants, showing um, a similar wave, which is uh, uh, later on. So of course, in newborns, uh, in infants, uh, signals, ERPs are delayed uh, because of um, cortical immaturity, of uh, not complete myelinization. So this wave is about 300 milliseconds, but still the effect uh, is very similar. And also the, the areas, the electrodes, are always in the sort of occipitotemporal areas. Of course, these studies um, uh, do not go into the uh, anatomical sources of, the, um, of this effect. And again, they, uh, uh, they stop at more or less two months old infants. There are no such studies in uh, uh, newborns. And uh, I will come into a few slides on the reasons why uh, no one did uh, EEG studies on newborns um, until now. Uh, but uh, the effect is that there is a sort of gap um, uh, in newborns. Uh, so in newborns, we only have uh, behavioral uh, experiments, uh, behavioral studies on phase processing, but we lack a sort of, uh, a sort of understanding on how their brain uh, is able to do this. Um, and since there is uh, this missing point, there are many um, uh, there are many theories about that because it's difficult then to uh, test them. Uh, and I just uh, uh, mention a few of them and to uh, formulate our hypothesis. So first of all, the neural substrate of this phase preference. Um, I mention here two uh, sort of extreme uh, uh, theories. One is by Johnson uh, saying that um, the visual cortex is probably too immature to uh, process phases in the newborn. Uh, uh, while the subcortical regions, it is known that they are very active, that they in fact uh, drive uh, in, in, in some way visual perception. Of course, this is uh, 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 an hypothesis um, in newborns. So his idea is that it is uh, super subcortical regions like the superior colliculus, in particular pulvinar and maybe amygdala, that can uh, drive this preference. Um, there are others saying that, in fact, the cortex uh, may be involved too, and in fact, uh, um, face preference could uh, also be driven by um, some regions involved in social interactions, because this is what face preference is about. Um, and I add this here that we don't know, in fact, if the face processing network is active or not. We, it might be. And uh, also, I mentioned. Uh, uh, another even more delicate question about predisposition. Do we have a face template uh, from birth or not? And here also there are two uh, sort of schools. Uh, one school is there is no face template, but there is a sort of proto-organization of the visual system uh, that uh, uh, for which uh, if you combine eccentricity gradients, special frequency gradients, and, uh, which is fundamental, a top-heavy bias in the visual system, you can uh, understand these, these three factors explain face preference. Um, while there is another school in saying, oh, no, this is not possible because the, the, the face preference is very strong uh, for the first minutes and uh, this top-heavy bias uh, doesn't, doesn't really work. And uh, um, so there is a face template somewhere, maybe in subcortical areas maybe in cortical areas. So here, um, what you try to um, uh, shed light on is mainly, for sure, the first question. So about the neural substrate, we really ask, is there a, a cortical route for faces already functional in newborns? And if there is, is it uh, uh, overlapping with the phase processing network that we know is functional even uh, a few months later on? Uh, in order to answer this question, first of all, what we use is these schematic phases. Uh, first of all, because they are behaviorally relevant. Uh, and uh, um, secondly, because the control is really strong. So really, the, the inverted phase is visually equivalent 
to the upright phase apart from the configuration of the, of the configuration. Um, and then we also try to dig a bit deeper in, uh, uh, in the phase, phase template debate by uh, adding um, a third condition with a scrambled phase. This phase is, uh, is not a phase uh, because uh, <laughs> eyes are, are, are asymmetric with respect to the midline uh, and with respect to the mouth, but still they contain more elements in the upper visual field with respect to the lower visual field. And this is uh, uh, for, for uh, the, the researchers that think that uh, we don't need a phase template for, um, for a phase preference, this kind of stimuli should uh, uh, be equivalent to the upright phases. And so they, they should uh, um, get the same uh, significant response with respect to inverted phases as the upright phases. So anyway, these are very simple stimuli. Um, uh, uh, these are three or maybe just two conditions so why no one did it before? Uh, and uh, there are many factors, probably, but I highlight two factors that then we uh, try to um, overcome. The first factor is you cannot do fMRI with newborns. It's practically too difficult. You can do an EEG, but EEG does not have the necessary special resolution to, for answering an anatomical question. And the second one is even if you were able to use EEG, newborn's visual attention is too short to obtain reliable responses. And this is because uh, newborns sleep most of the time. And uh, when they are awake, they are awake because they are hungry and uh, they want to eat, so they are not calm, and then they eat and they get to sleep again. That's, that's uh, the typical <laughs> pattern of a newborn in the first three days. So it's very difficult to have uh, their visual attention on more than uh, a, a really a few minutes. So now I show you why both uh, we think that we overcome uh, uh, both, uh, both issues. The first issue about spatial resolution. In fact, um, the cause of the uh, low spatial resolution of electroencephalography is the fact that we have a skull and the skull bones uh, smear the uh, electrical fields generated by the neurons. Uh, so that uh, uh, what we have at the level of the scalp is a very smeared picture of what's inside. And that's why it's difficult to infer the sources. But if you look at the skull of the newborn, uh, his, uh, uh, he, it is very thin. Here, uh, uh, here it's a figure uh, showing the, how the thickness uh, grows from newborn to three years old. So in this period, it grows by a factor of five, more or less. So this is... Uh, 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 so the one of the newborn is, is uh, about uh, 1.52 millimeters, and, and then it goes up to 6 millimeters for 3 years old, and then it grows, I think, uh, about a factor of 3 up to when we are adult. And also the material of the, of the bone is, is much more soft in the case of the newborn uh, with respect to the adult. So in fact, uh, um, the newborn, uh, so EG newborn has a higher special resolution, and um, this is, sh this is uh, uh, you can see this from this kind of uh, computation. So here, um, researchers uh, Odabae and Al, this is the group of Vanatalo in Finland, they computed the special correlation of EG signals um, in, func in function of the distance between electrons. So we ha you have here the uh, s uh, distance in, sim in sim centimeters, and first, look at the adults. So for the adult one, if you look at correlation, special correlations within electrons distant 10 centimeters, so it's a lot, they still have a correlation of about 0.4. While for newborns, uh, if you go at 5 centimeters, the correlation is already 0. So uh, uh, EG in newborns is much less specially correlated, meaning that it represents much more clearly the, um, the underlying uh, sources. And uh, so uh, since we have uh, a system, an EEG system with 125 electrodes, so it's a very dense system. And uh, since recently uh, mm, this group of uh, Vanatalo in Finland uh, uh, developed a newborn head model for social construction, which they kindly shared with us, 
uh, we thought that we were able to do uh, a reliable EEG source reconstruction. So fine for the first point. The second point concerns the fact of being able to obtain a reliable EEG response in the um, uh, br very brief uh, uh, intervals of uh, attention, of visual attention of the newborn. And here we talk about uh, even less than one minute per condition. Um, and uh, in order to explain you, uh, so what we used is uh, um, a frequency tagging paradigm. So uh, we used uh, a stimuli that uh, oscillate in time and I will briefly explain to you why this, uh, this works much better than the eventuality potentials. So for example, if you have a flickering checkerboard like this, this is uh, um, a stimulation that drives your visual system very strongly uh, so that in, in the e if you record the EG signals, you would expect that you would see a response for every trial. But in fact, you don't see that. Uh, you see that for every single trial, zero is the time of the switch between the black and the, and the white um, uh, squares, uh, single trial EEG doesn't show really uh, a clear response. And the reason for this is that uh, EEG is the sum of the event-related res response plus the ongoing EEG activity and artifacts. So uh, it's, it's a sort of C in which it is difficult to, to extract the event related potential. And what is typically done in event related potential experiments is that you average across many presentation of the, uh, of the stimulus. And then after averaging over 50 trials, you get a response in this case at about 100 milliseconds. Um, but if you think that the stimulus has a very clear frequency signature because it, it is at 4 hertz in frequency, <coughs> you can imagine that the regions that respond to the stimulus also have a peak at this frequency. So you can use this frequency as a tag to, uh, uh, to extract the uh, event-related response from your EEG data. And in fact, if you uh, compute the power spectrum in the very same electrode uh, that I show here, you see a very sharp peak at 4 hertz. And if you uh, uh, develop a measure of the peak, which is the just the power at that tag frequency normalized by the power at neighboring frequencies, you obtain a similar to topography to that one. So we are talking about sort of the same response. But the signal to noise ratio <coughs> is five times higher because uh, um, because the ongoing activity and also the artifacts will uh, most likely not have this kind of peak. They would just shift the power a little bit uh, up and down. But uh, this, is a, uh, this is a way to, be, uh, to extract a very specific response. So OK, we found the method. Um, uh, here I show uh, we, how we um, uh, do our experiments. Uh, so uh, this is these tiny heads. Um, uh, we put, uh, we apply this system, EGI system, which is um, very easy to uh, apply for newborns. So you just put it very quickly, and you need no preparation. And uh, and then you show newborns. We show newborns in front, very close. These very big images. So these images have the same size of a real face, and uh, and they look like this very slowly, because we want to be sure that the newborn can be entrained to this stimulus. And th this is like a sort of peekaboo. So when, when, uh, when, they, are, they, when they look at it, uh, they, they can be really entrained to this uh, kind of dynamics. And, uh, but of course, it's a challenge. So um, just to give you some data about it, of course, what we did, we, we monitored the uh, fixation all the time because we want to analyze the EEG data, only the EEG data during which newborns are looking at the image. So it's segmented on fixation interval. And out of 55 subjects uh, um, for which we, we were able to put the cup on, we, get, we got only 10 valid subjects because, of course, they, they usually get asleep or they move, so uh, it's, it's, it's a challenge. But we, we got there. Slowly, we got there. So uh, even with this, we have, uh, after artifact ejection, because anyway, there are moments in which they, they, they move, 
we have about 35 seconds per condition per subject. And uh, uh, no difference in fixation time between conditions because when you present, this is also a known behavioral result, when you present uh, faces and inverted faces frontally in different blocks, uh, newborns look at them uh, with no difference in, uh, in fixation time. It, it, the difference is when they, they are displayed uh, at the same time. So no confound, no statistical confound about the conditions. And uh, uh, first of all, if we put the data all together, uh, we, uh, the first thing that we looked at is whether there is a resonance. Uh, and in fact, there is a resonance. This is the power spectrum. But um, uh, as you can see, uh, we are at a very low frequency. And it is a very well-known aspect of EEG data. Uh, it's uh, uh, that the power spectrum uh, goes up as 1 over f for uh, decreasing frequencies. And in fact, this is, uh, this is linked to the long-range temporal correlations that are uh, intrinsic in the EEG data. So in order to have um, uh, a, a good measure of, of the peak, what we did is uh, we uh, divided the amplitude at the tag frequency 0 0.8 by the a fit, uh, a power low fit of the background EEG activity at the same frequency. Um, so if we do like that and we take all the data together, we find that there is a, a big uh, resonance coming up. And uh, here, as well as for the rest of the talk, uh, the statistical analysis that we are using is an analysis that is not based on, the, uh, um, on each electrode. So it overcomes the multiple comparison problem of uh, recording the statistics at each, at each electrode. With, uh, um, with a statistical tool that uh, looks at clusters, <laughs> special clusters of uh, electrodes that are significant uh, or not. So this is very significant. And uh, um, then if we look at each uh, single stimulus, we found uh, a resonance, so a significant response for all the three stimuli. So we are sure that in for all the three cases, in all the three conditions, uh, newborns are entrained to this kind of stimulation. And then we, um, we computed our main contest, which is uh, comparing upright faces with inverted faces. And what we found is a very strong effect uh, uh, with two different clusters, one uh, posterior uh, um, medial cluster, uh, partly media, partly not, and uh, one anterior cluster. These clusters are highly significant. And uh, um, out of these clusters, um, out of this kind of topography, we also did uh, source reconstruction, uh, as I told you. And uh, what we found is um, a very important overlap of this um, distribution in source space with the uh, phase processing network in adults. I, I highlight here. Um, by tilting the, uh, the um, anatomy in such a way that it compares with the uh, uh, Jim's figure uh, many years ago. Uh, as you can see, uh, for sure, this kind of activity, which is, of course, more smeared than an fMRI activity. We don't have such a special resolution. But still, you see that uh, it overlaps uh, the OFA and the STS, and a little bit in towards the fusiform gyrus, even if it doesn't really reach the FFA. Um, and uh, uh, but also you see here some more anterior regions, the anterior medial uh, temporal lobe, which has also been found uh, in, in monkeys and I believe in adults as well, and also some more frontal regions that could be probably connected with uh, uh, regions involved in social interaction and in the uh, familiarity, uh, as works by uh, Ida uh, have shown. Um, okay, so yes, sure, sure. Um, what anatomical template were you using for source reconstruction, for instance? Okay, the, it's a good question. So, what we used is the one that was developed by Sam Savanatalo, who is a Finnish researcher, in, uh, very expert in newborns. And uh, um, it is done like this. So, the, the, the um, uh, the skull, all the surfaces around the cortex are the ones extracted by a newborn anatomy. 
uh, while the, the inner cortex is not extracted from, from an fMRI from, from the newborn because it is uh, very difficult to segment white from, uh, from gray matter. So what he did is to uh, transform a, um, a cortex uh, template from adult uh, to the level of jurification of, of, the, of the newborn. So it smoothed it up to uh, the level of jurification of the newborn and he put it inside this, uh, these surfaces that are of the newborn. Thank you. Yep. Mark, Mark, Mark. Yes. How, how much should we put into the, the intensities that we're seeing in the newborn response there? So if I look at the area some in the vicinity of OFA, it yes. looks like there's a pretty strong response. If I look yep. around FFA, yes. it's not as strong. Yes. Sh should we draw some inferences from that, or should we not be all that confident in these differences? So um, uh, what I show here, first of all, is a statistical map. Uh, over the sources of the comparison between the um, the two uh, the inverted uh, the upright and inverted faces at the level of the sources, so it is a, a statistical map. Um, uh, so about the uh, reliability of uh, this distribution, we did some tests uh, by uh, simulating. Um, so what we did is to uh, simulate the sources in this space and uh, add some noise, which is uh, correspondent to the kind of ongoing activity that we see in the EEG uh, uh, data of the, of the newborn, and then reconstruct back these, these sources. And we see that the spread is, is, is pretty limited. So we are, I mean, I cannot be confident that this point, I mean, that uh, uh, it's, not, it's here and not here very close, but I can be confident that uh, uh, um, I mean, uh, I would say that uh, what we tested is uh, one centimeter square patches that uh, in with source reconstruction, they smear uh, double maybe. So uh, I would be pretty confident on that. Okay, so. Um, yes, yes. What would something like this look like if you tried to replicate this in adolescents or adults? Mm -hmm. So if you use the same kind of frequency tagging procedure yes. and did source localization. So uh, with, with their thick skulls and, and then and, and this, this would faces instead of schematic faces. Um, with EEG this would replicate probably worse, much worse because of the skull. So I'm, I'm, I'm used to much, I mean, I, I've been working with EEG data on, on adults for a long time, and <coughs> I know they are, they are much more smeared. I can see it by eye on the, uh, on, on the, um, at, at the sensor level. Um, so the, the, <coughs> the comparison would be uh, ideally with MEG data, in fact. Uh, because I think they are not adult MEG data are not so far from what we can get to newborns. Uh, of course, there are uh, methods and m methodological um, uh, developments that we thought about to also constrain the the to also be sure about the mapping of the sensor position on the head of the newborn. Uh, there is now uh, a possibility of. Um, uh, putting both of them in a 3D space, even with a simple camera, so that we, we do a sort of digitization that is similar to what we've done with the MEG. Uh, this is something that we want to do, and we didn't do it yet. So this, uh, but uh, I'm confident that uh, uh, these are pretty reliable uh, reconstructions. These, these areas in your map, yes, the anterior temporal area. And this prefrontal area yes. are now accepted parts of the visual uh, face processing system in adults. That's great. Okay. And yes. Our 2000 paper didn't include those, although there was evidence even at that time yeah. of yeah. their existence. But now it's incontrovertible. And so this map with that pre prefrontal area and the anterior temporal area is really interesting. <laughs> That's good. <great>. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so. Um, one thing that we asked is whether, uh, so of course we have 10 subjects, so this is a result, uh, I mean, to be confirmed. 
Uh, but still, what we wanted to also to see is whether uh, this effect uh, would grow with age. We, that's what we were thinking about, because uh, maybe the, the visual system uh, develops better and better. Uh, so we, we, we look at the correlation between the effect and, uh, um, and age in hours. And in fact, we saw a, an inverted relation for which the effect, in fact, is in fact stronger for younger infants, for younger newborns. And uh, um, is that driven mostly by an increase uh, in preference to the inverted face? over time or over the hours of life uh, or a decrease in the preference in the amplitude of response to the I think the phase. first one that you said okay. yes yes I think so yeah um, uh, I, I, I would like to look deeper on that but I think uh, that's the reason why and uh, so uh, in fact one possibility uh, that we thought about is that we here we are using schematic stimuli that could look at uh, like supernormal stimuli for newborns. So when, when they are just born in the first hours, their visual system is very, uh, uh, very immature. So they could be uh, grabbed very much by this kind of stimuli. And maybe after, I mean, here it's three, four days. After three or four days, they become a bit more uh, um, attuned to the faces and they can get the final details. So these stimuli can be, uh, I mean, uh, this face stimuli can be a bit uh, less interesting with respect to faces. But they're also, see, these are the same subjects. Yes. So they're repeatedly seeing these pictures. If you, I mean, I just don't know what would happen and I, you need more than 10 subjects. <laughs> but if you showed them, if you showed those same pictures to a newborn only at 80 hours and they'd never seen them before, do you, do you know whether this would happen? How much of it is familiarity? How much of it is training? So, uh, I mean, I didn't... So, uh, no, 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 I mean, this is, no, these are not, this is not the same newborn, eh? Oh. Uh, uh, these Which are different newborns. Before. Yes, never yes. Seen them no, 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 ah, no, 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 no. It would be interesting to, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, uh, to take one newborn and do it uh, every four hours <laughs> and <laughs> see uh, <laughs> what happens. <laughs> it's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> you have no repeat studies then? No, 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 no. It's so already very no difficult. No sense of familiarity or training? Uh, no, 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 no. They, they, have, they have for sure never seen this kind of schematic faces. Yes, yes, yes. uh, but it's a good <laughs> suggestion. Real faces. Huh? Uh, so, there's, so there's been a lot of learning yeah. for real faces. Yes, and yes. And in fact, uh, absolutely. So what we want to do uh, is to do the same kind of experiment with real faces, so real and inverted, and see whether we can find something like uh, an inverse correlation for which they are, at the beginning, uh, there are less faces than what their immature system can see, but then they, they get more and more experts, and they like them more than the schematic ones. But I'm also wondering if there's a novelty effect. If they know the, you know, if they know faces, they'll look more, more isn't there an effect where they'll look more at something that they haven't seen? Uh, possibly, but the then, language. but then why they would make so much of a difference between the two? I <laughs> No, 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 yes, <laughs> I'm just uh, following up. <laughs> um, it's, uh, in fact, uh, the whole point is uh, also the inverted phase is, uh, I mean, visually equivalent from the point of view of a new stimulus. Yes. So I should preface this question with I do not have a baby and have very minimal experience. Okay. <laughs> How often do babies see upside down faces? Because people coming up to the crib, yeah. if the baby is oriented this way, yes, coming up to it and looking at it like that, versus looking at it like this. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe, maybe there would be less of an inverted face effect because they get because they, they see f they see okay. faces in both orientations with less frequency until they are at some age when they are more often top right. I, I don't this know. Is, again, somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think that usually people uh, uh, look. Uh, I mean, they don't. Uh, they don't pose themselves <laughs> inverted. This would be a bit. Uh, <laughs> but sometimes, for sure. Sometimes, for sure. But I think uh, mo most often, also because uh, 
uh, I think that uh, then there are other factors apart from the visual uh, uh, display of a face, of course, uh, that boost for sure face preference, which is voice, which is all the uh, other uh, channels of interaction that come together with the face. So I guess then, actually, now that I'm looking at your stimuli a little more closely, the, the neck is also yes. oriented. So it, it, yes. even, if, even if they were the like yes. configuration yes. of the stimuli That's, is yeah. actually still absolutely. Uh, yeah. incorrect in its inverted yeah. format. Absolutely. Yeah, so you, you, you gave a better response. <laughs> 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 OK, so um, what about the third condition, scumbal faces? Um, uh, so what we see with scumbal faces, first of all, if we compare scumbal faces with inverted faces, that there is no statistical difference at all. If we compare them with uh, uh, upright faces, in fact, there is a marginal significance for which uh, upright faces have a stronger response than uh, scrambled faces. But this is marginal significance. So I'm, 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 I'm still, uh, I cannot say that there is a significant difference. And then I looked at uh, single subjects' response for the three kind of stimuli. So uh, if you uh, see, um, so red, histograms refer to upright faces and blue ones to inverted faces. So if you see subject by subject, uh, red is always higher than blue. So the face preference is reproduced for every single subject. Uh, but the green ones are very variable, in fact. For in some subjects, they are equivalent to the inverted face response. In some subjects, they are more similar to the, uh, to the upright face response. So what I think, what I think it happens here is, in fact, that this scrambled face, uh, uh, well, for sure, it doesn't drive the, the, the face preference as the face, that's for sure, because it is not uh, statistically different from the inverted face, but sometimes might be perceived as a sort of uh, uh, bizarre face. So maybe uh, uh, the stimulus itself cannot say more uh, something more than this. But for sure, it is, uh, it it does not confirm that top-heavy kind of bias, because otherwise it would have been statistically uh, different from the inverted face as the upright face. Yes? Um, how can, what is, so my, my question is like, what is the um, thinking behind saying that um, the scrambled face is seen as an abnormal face, rather than, I don't know, just a weird object that I've never seen? So where, how did you so come to that conclusion? Um, uh, so first of all, the scramble face uh, comes from studies, behavioral studies, showing that if you uh, if you display an upright face and a scramble face, there is no difference in looking times uh, preferences between the two. So that's the origin. That's the the basic experiment that. Uh, uh, that pushed these researchers to say, okay, the top-heavy bias is sufficient for the face preference. Um, and the, the, the fact that is, uh, uh, so inferring that sometimes it is perceived that this, the face really comes a bit from this data and also from my intuition. Uh, so it's, uh, and also, f I mean, it is very variable, uh, the effect. So uh, it, can, it cannot be so, uh, um, just the top heavy bias it's 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 mixed that's my my feeling <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm maybe doing late okay um okay i i run to the conclusions for this part um so in fact uh, we found evidence of a cortical root for face perception overlapping with several several regions in the adult face processing network uh, so we are showing that they it's already functional shortly after birth uh, so um, this region might might uh, 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 only them or maybe together with the subcortical regions represents a sort of predisposed face template. Of course, this is uh, I, we cannot um, about predisposition is difficult to prove it, but for sure what we show is is a cortical uh, activity which is very uh, very compatible with the face processing network. And uh, what I want to add here is um, uh, with EEG, we could not investigate the subcortical activity because subcortical regions, uh, mm, first of all, they are very far from the, from, the, from the surface. 
and most importantly, the orientation of neurons in the subcortical areas is such that uh, you, you, they cannot produce, they produce very weak EEG signals. So it is very, very unlikely that what we see has a subcortical origin. Uh, and that's why we can uh, talk about uh, cortical activity, but we don't know whether uh, how much subcortical activity is there uh, in the same, uh, in the same uh, uh, experiment. And, uh, and lastly, uh, as I was saying, the top-heavy bias does not explain face, face preference. It, it is a sort of ambiguous result, but for sure, being uh, statistically not significantly different from the inverted phase, it is not sufficient for face preference alone. So uh, I did a bit late. Do, do I have the time to go through uh, the last, uh, the just the, the number, the number processing? OK, good. <laughs> So uh, this is very preliminary results. So uh, ah, okay, no, th this I can uh, jump. Um, no, in fact, I have a couple of other things to say about this. Um, first of all, so there are studies showing that with uh, uh, newborns at around eight, ten days of age, um, uh, these are st behavioral studies uh, showing this uh, looking uh, preferential looking paradigm with, with the faces and showing that uh, children at high risk, so they are siblings of uh, autistic children, have not the preference for upright faces compared to uh, uh, control children. And so on the basis of this, we thought that since we are able to record uh, a reliable EEG response in a very short time, it could, uh, um, our EEG uh, measure could constitute a sort of neuromarket for ASD screening. Uh, but of course, you cannot go travel with this, uh, uh, with this big EEG system. To, uh, that's, the, that's a practical problem. You cannot uh, also, because for testing these kind of children, you have to run uh, uh, where they are born uh, around in Italy. Uh, and so you need a very light system. Uh, that could uh, do this biomarker. But we were lucky enough to start collaborating with some engineers uh, in uh, Bologna and uh, in, uh, in Trento. And these engineers developed um, a very uh, light and very small processor, uh, uh, which is a something like a two by four centimeters, very flat uh, device that uh, can be connected with uh, dry electrodes and drive, um, for example, uh, now for up to now eight electrodes, and, uh, um, and is very efficient. You can drive it from an iPhone. Uh, so one project that we have and for which we had a, a grant for developing is to develop with this kind of sense, uh, with this kind of processor, uh, a very um, portable wireless EG system that we could then use for uh, testing uh, children around. Um, OK, and now I go to the number processing. Uh, so back to uh, the, 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 the word the, of number processing that Manuela uh, described yesterday in her talk. So she uh, briefly mentioned that this, uh, the number sense, so a very early sense of cardinality, is already present in newborns. And this was uh, proven with um, uh, this study done by uh, Veronique Izar about 10 years ago, in which uh, what she did is the following. She presented uh, newborns, for example, with uh, a stream of sounds, uh, for example, four sounds. So you would hear tu, 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 pa, 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 pa. And would, they would get habituated to, to this number. And then they were presented with either four images for uh, guys or 12 guys. Uh, and what we sh she showed is that um, uh, newborns spontaneously match the number of sounds they hear to the number of objects they see, uh, for which uh, they look longer when the number is congruent than when if the number is incongruent. So they do a real multimodal matching of the, of the number. Um, which is uh, absolutely reliable. This is uh, um, a, a study that was also replicated uh, at least a couple of times. 
So um, here the approach is the same as the approach of the um, phase study. We, what we are interested in is to understand whether uh, this uh, skill um, is based on the same brain systems that uh, underlie number processing in adults and in older infants. So in order to do this, we adapted this kind of design to uh, the frequency tagging uh, paradigm. So the, 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 the sound stream is really the same. Uh, the only thing that changes is that uh, now the, um, uh, the images are uh, presented in a frequency tagging fashion with exactly the same kind of uh, frequency. So first of all, it was not easy to do this. It was more difficult to, to run this experiment with respect to the phase processing experiment because uh, children are less interested in something that is not a phase. <laughs> uh, uh, so we, after a while, uh, we, we calibrated the stimuli in such a way that uh, they liked it more. And this is really out of seven subjects, I think. So please take it as a preliminary result. And we found something, in fact, unexpected. So we, we expected uh, a, a, a sort of parietal effect with the congruent that would not be there with the incongruent conditions. But in fact, we found that the incongruent condition gives a stronger response than the congruent one. And uh, 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 so here, the, the cluster which is more significant is the anterior cluster. Um, still a bit noisy, but this uh, we see in, in, in most of the subjects, uh, that for us could be like, could signal like a prediction error. So uh, this would mean that uh, newborns are so uh, uh, aware of coding of the number, of the abstract number they extract from, from the two sources, that they really uh, uh, show a sort of mismatch when the two numbers are different which is surprising to find some, some effect like this in, in newborns. And here there is a uh, right realized effect that could maybe uh, be uh, due to uh, an effect in the parietal cortex. So um, I hope I will uh, be able to confirm these results. And I didn't have the time yet to do the source reconstruction. So this is ongoing work. Uh, and I will just finish with a. Uh, um, final slide on the methodology. So I think that we, uh, our method um, uh, is promising to fill in the gap of uh, studies in cognitive neuroscience and newborns, which until now are mainly behavioral. And we showed that with the frequency tagging design, uh, even if with the stimulation as short as 30 seconds, if newborns are looking at the stimulus, we can get a reliable response. And uh, we show that source reconstruction, in fact, uh, is possible uh, with EEG newborns. And uh, therefore, we think that this kind of paradigm can be adapted. Uh, in fact, it's totally flexible to uh, a variety of stimuli and can be adapted to investigate the neural substrates of other perceptual and cognitive functions in newborns. And thank you for your attention. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Uh, I'm curious as to the lack of a response inside the VTC for um, face stimuli. Okay. And for the face inverted faces. And I'm just curious if you would think that like testing things like just a curvature, like an oval versus a square, if you would see any response of just like other known um, examples of VTC substrates that might arise and whether it's a thing that VTC hasn't been, um, hasn't come to be fully developed yet um, and that it's just not picking up on the um, the that its faces are appearing there, or whether it's um, just the faces are showing up in other regions. Uh, it's a good question, <laughs> for which I don't know. Uh, um, I don't know. Um, I cannot be sure of the answer. Of course, um, it's possible that in fact it is not well developed yet. Uh, it is also possible that maybe um, uh, the schematic faces 
really drive the very first steps of uh, recognition of the pattern, uh, which is maybe a bit earlier, a bit posterior of these parts. And m so maybe, uh, um, maybe if we do the same experiment with real faces, uh, slowly this, this, uh, this system goes up and becomes functional. That's what I, I would think. Of. Yes. You didn't talk a lot about it, but you showed some slides there where there's this right hemisphere bias in your results. Yes. Right? Yes. Sure. Um, and is, does the top heavy account have any way to account for these hemispheric differences? Does it make those sorts of predictions? I would assume not, but. I don't think so. Uh, I, um, I don't think so because it's, um, if I go to the, um, just EG data, oh, sorry, what I want to see is this one. Uh, so I'm just thinking about, uh, this is just the scalp data of the uh, invert, uh, of the scrambled one. Uh, as far as I remember is, uh, I, I, I tried some uh, source reconstruction on the single conditions. And uh, it doesn't show so much right lateralization as the uh, as the upright face one. So I have another question about the top heavy. So in almost in all the experiments <coughs> I can think of, it's always a direct view of the face yes. at the infancy. Yes. Do people ever show? You can imagine, say, a silhouette, for example, shown from the side, and you might imagine that the infants are going to be more interested in that than if you invert the stimulus or do some other manipulations with it. Yes. Have there been behavioral studies that have used Silhouettes like that? Not that I know of. I can imagine that could get away from the those silhouettes being top heavy. Yes, yes. Uh, not that I'm aware of, but of course, uh, yes, it's uh, it's possible that it's a big, if big you area. yes, yes, it's also possible that uh, if you start uh, letting the child uh, move the head and maybe the 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 perception of the face changes if it's not in the in, in the middle of the visual field, but on the on the side, yeah. why not? Yes. Um, my question is kind of similar to what Brad was asking, but I'm really intrigued by the fact that you're finding these frontal areas mm -hmm. in the infant data. Yes. Um, I was wondering if anyone has used, like Brad was suggesting, a side view face, but with two faces. So you have two templates and then two faces kind of schematically um, in front of the infant. Because yes. My my intuition is that that is really reflecting some preparation for a system that will encode social information about yes. these face templates in the future. Yes. And these areas will continue to develop with the development of the infant. Yes. I'm wondering if when you do the real faces experiment, if you maybe want to consider having two faces, not just one in some condition. OK, so the problem of having two faces is eye movements. Uh, with EEG. Uh, so that's why we present the face uh, centrally, because if we present faces not centrally, uh, and two, fa I mean, if we present just one face, that could work if, if the newborn is only looking there. But if uh, the newborn starts moving his eyes a lot, uh, this creates artifacts in the EEG data. Uh, but what I can tell you is that, in fact, uh, one of the experiments that you, we, are, we are starting uh, starting preparing is about eye gaze, uh, which, which is uh, uh, for sure uh, connected with uh, investigating whether areas uh, involved in social interaction are already functional as, as, um, as they're, they're shown to be functional later on. And the, the, the study with eye gaze is uh, uh, um, adapted from a study from uh, Farroni showing that uh, so the, the, the two stimuli are uh, a face looking directly to you and uh, a face with an averted gaze. So we, we plan to do that. Yes. Um, one of the limitations of EEG with the old potential is you have to have a very discrete onset to uh, synchronize the, the averaging with the old potential. Yes. Which means, which really precludes using dynamic video like stimuli yes. in the remote potential study. Yeah. Do you think with frequency tagging you can start to have more dynamic stimuli? Uh, absolutely. I mean, this uh, 
this kind, so here we are looking at the power spectrum. <coughs> so when you do the e FFT and you extract the, 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 the power, it doesn't, uh, it is totally independent of the phase of the stimulus. So uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not important when, I mean, if when a child, uh, uh, what is the phase at which the child is time locked to the present reference of the phase. So uh, this, is, uh, this is another reason for which maybe frequency tagging works uh, so well with this kind of newborns, because um, with, with ERPs, also with a bit older infants, I imagine that there can be a lot of variations in, 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 in the time of encoding the stimulus uh, that uh, are overcome with this kind of uh, method. Of course, this, uh, a limit of this is that uh, the you choose the dynamics, and dynamics has to be exactly oscillatory. But uh, even with non-oscillatory dynamics, you could still uh, uh, sort of correlate the dynamics of what you present, a continuous dynamic, with, uh, with the EG signal and try to extract information for that. There are methods developing for that. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thanks to you.